there and welcome to the program. Joining me on the panel tonight, Shadow Minister for Families and Social Services, Linda Burney. Hi. Former lawyer, author and advocate, Bree Lee. Finance journalist, Alan Kohler, who works across the ABC, The New Daily and The Eureka Report. Psychologist turned politician, Liberal member for Reid, Fiona Martin. And journalist and author of See What You Made Me Do, which is now a documentary series, Jess Hill. Please make all of them feel welcome. grant us exemptions to go to India to look after our loved ones who are fighting for their lives. Then you abandon us, leave us to die in a country that's gasping for air. What kind of government does that to their own people? In 2019, the Prime Minister said that Australia is like a fragrant gutter masala. In 2020, the Prime Minister said that on a Saturday that when I'm free, I like to make it a family curry night. For the Prime Minister, is the value of Indians reduced to just our food, or does he see us as equals? Before we go to the panel, how do, did this decision, this travel ban, and the threat of criminal penalties make you feel? It's horrific. I've got family, extended family and friends in India, and each day we hear stories that, you know, we can't even talk about those stories. There's What's going on in India is horrible, and to know that we're not treated the same as everyone else, it's just appalling. Fiona Mann. Yeah, hi. Um, look, obviously it's a devastating situation in India at the moment with over 300,000 cases per day. Um, and, you know, many people are finding this period incredibly difficult, um, not having seen loved ones for so long, particularly in my electorate of Reid. Um, the travel ban that's been put in place has been based um, on health advice, expert health advice. Last month we saw over 40% of people that were travelling home from India testing positive to COVID-19 in comparison to other countries, for example, people coming from the United States that were only testing um, about 6%. Um, so this is based on travel advice um, and this ban, obviously the government wants to resume repatriation flights as soon as possible. Um, in the last 12 months, um, the Australian government has facilitated 38 flights from India to Australia for Australians and that was approximately 5,000 Australians returning home from India. Fiona now, Mann, almost 5% of your electorate is made up of people of Indian origin. Are they telling you that they believe this has made them feel lesser uh, citizens, that this is perhaps racially motivated? No, I, I think people understand the high incidence of COVID-19 in India at the moment, which is devastating for the country. Um, is, is The decision by the Australian government is based on health advice so that we don't increase the risk or have a, a, an outbreak here in Australia. But you, but you so, haven't heard that from any of your constituents, the sorts of sentiments we're hearing tonight. The, the, the penalty is, is what has been of concern um, by constituents, not the ban itself. Um, and as I mentioned um, earlier in the week, that I thought that the travel, um, pe the penalty um, was a little heavy handed um, and that, um, you know, that, that part of it was, was problematic. However, the Prime Minister has said um, that it is very unlikely that that will be um, put into effect. So what we're focusing on right now is increasing the capacity of the Howard Springs facility from 850 people to 2,000 people so that we can accommodate more people here in Australia and resume repatriation flights as soon as possible from India. Linda Burney, based on medical advice, and the government is now planning to get them home. Uh, I think this issue raises more questions. Um, and I respect Fiona's uh, answer, but it just seems to me um, a number of things. First of all, uh, the government has clearly not handled quarantine well and certainly repatriation very poorly. So uh, that's the first point. The second point is this, is that for the, we're not talking about people who are not Australian citizens. I mean, that's the point. They are Australian citizens and Australian governments are responsible for keeping their citizens safe and providing them with as much support 
as possible in difficult circumstances. And the other thing to remember is that for someone from India to take out citizenship in Australia, Indian citizenship, citizenship has to be renounced. Now, that's not the case everywhere, and that's a big thing. And finally, Hamish, why announce uh, fines up to, what is it, $66,000 and five years jail, and then two days later, both the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister says, oh, well, I'll never be used. Why announce them in the first place? And I think... <laughs> and I, I, I think, and um, I have a very multicultural electorate as well, is that, that there are a number of Indian people who are feeling, who are Australians with Indian heritage, who are feeling absolutely abandoned and uh, the repatriation flights that are being resumed, I hope are not a response, a political response to a human issue. Alan Collar. Can I just say, can I just intervene? This is not a political response. This is a health response. This decision has been based on health advice. Well, I'm pretty sick of the health officials being lumbered with this is what the health officials have advised. This is a political decision. Let us be clear. I wonder whether the Prime Minister watched the Premiers last year take health advice and make really tough decisions throughout last year to announce lockdowns and uh, as a result of that became more popular. All of the Premiers were tremendously popular because of that and I reckon the Prime Minister probably thought that if he took health advice and, took a, and made a very harsh decision <laughs> on this, mm. he'd be more popular. But the miscalculation was that Australians, I think, are very happy to make sacrifices themselves for the greater good, mm. but they're not happy asking other people who are less fortunate themse than themselves mm. to make sacrifices for them. Mm. Mm. I endured 25 years of verbal, emotional and, in the end, physical abuse and what I now know is coercive control and gaslighting. I fled to save my life and I often now think if it's a life worth living. I will always be on medication. I doubt that I'll ever repartner and I don't have my own family anymore. It's more than a mother can bear sometimes, I can tell you. Um, I hear Jess Hill saying that this is solvable. What will criminalisation of coercive control, how will it fix this? Jess Hill. Thanks so much for your question, Sue, and I'm just so sorry for what you were subjected to and what you still have to live with. I think when I talk about criminalising coercive control and when others talk about it, we're actually not talking about fixing the entire system. What we're talking about is fixing what I believe to be a broken part of our criminal justice system. Um, it's something that was set up in the 1980s when we first thought about how can we get police involved in what is, you know, crimes happening in households all across the nation. And obviously people thought, well, we need proof. You need to have a physical incident so that you can gather evidence. And what we've since understood is that actually that only gets to, to certain parts of a puzzle and they're disparate. And for some people, physical violence isn't present at all. And for those people, the access to the criminal justice system is basically denied. And so what we're proposing with criminalising coercive control is to make the entire arc of what you were subjected to visible, not just the physical incidents, not just the things that our criminal justice system recognises now, but everything from the start to the finish so that we understand what the risks are, what the damage has been and how dangerous the offender is. And I think that once we understand coercive control from a criminal justice system perspective, it has a flow on effect to how coercive control is understood from a health perspective in the family law system and also how it's reported because the way that crime and domestic violence crime is reported in the media is based on assault. So general public understands domestic violence primarily through the lens of assault and not as it actually is, which is in the majority of cases that are serious, coercive control. Brie Lee. Yeah, um, look, I really commend Jess for the work that she's done in putting 
even just the terminology of coercive control into the mainstream in Australia. That's huge. Um, what I am concerned about, and I certainly don't think we're disagreeing with each other in any sense, is that it is, for many reasons, it seems to be easier in Australia to reform legislation than it does to be, than it, than it is to reform policing. And my concern um, is that one of the potential wonderful effects of criminalising coercive control is that it broadens the type of evidence, for example, that can be brought. And my expertise is in with sex crime rather than domestic and family abuse, but this is where they overlap, where we hear from a lot of survivors that they don't feel like they have the opportunity to actually tell their story and give any context, because as Jess was saying, the law is only set up to deal with these specific instances. What I'm concerned about is that at the moment, for example, it takes easily three, four, five years for an allegation of any kind of sex crime matter to make it from preliminary complaint through to trial. If we're broadening the types of matters that can be considered criminal, that would need to happen with such an incredibly huge extra commitment of resourcing and not just training, but retraining, learning for police and unlearning um, otherwise, what I'm seeing is, is a potential for, for more people to enter a system that is not built for them the way it is now. Uh, Linda Burney. Uh, hi, Sue, and thanks for your bravery. And uh, I stand with you and certainly know the shoes that you've stood in in a very personal way myself. Um, the issue of coercive control uh, is something... And I agree with everything that everyone said, but it's something that I want people to know about. Mm -hmm. It's something that I want young people to understand. And it's something that I want people to understand is often the basis to destroying a person. Um, you know, you can get your bones broken, you can get spat on, you can get choked, uh, you can experience all those things. But coercive control destroys you from inside. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes away who you are. And to rebuild that is a very difficult thing to do. I, like Jess, agree that coercive control should be criminalised. I know there are arguments around it. I know that it's difficult uh, because of the... The, the way in which domestic violence is viewed. Uh, but it is such a prevalent thing in most DV relationships, it has to be dealt with, um, either through a legal response, but certainly uh, governments have a responsibility. And what I'm on about, Hamish, is having a national definition of domestic violence that includes coercive, coercive control. So we're all operating from the same space. Hi, my husband and I have 10 week old twins. Uh, I was the main income earner, so we decided that I would go back to work and he would stay at home as the stay at home dad, the primary caregiver. According to the paid parental leave scheme, my husband isn't recognised as a primary caregiver and can't claim it. It relies on the birth mother claiming it, and then the father can have the um, payments transferred to him, recognising him as the primary caregiver only if it's transferred. I don't meet the eligibility criteria as I earn over the income threshold, so neither of us qualify. If my husband, however, earned my income uh, and our roles were reversed and I was on his income, staying at home, we would be eligible. Uh, we've asked to be considered under exceptional circumstances, but we're told that it was my choice to return to work and therefore not exceptional. My question to the panel is, do such policies represent an underlying gender bias which hinders the goal of bridging the gender pay gap and devalues women in the workplace and in society? Alan Kohler. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> of course. <laughs> mm. I mean... And it's... It clearly is a gender bias that goes back in history that we haven't yet thrown off. And I think that the, clearly the laws, uh, the, the budgets, the laws, uh, the, the bureaucracies need to uh, even things up, of course. I mean, uh, um, uh, having read Jess Hill's book, I've just 
uh, got myself halfway through the second sext by um, Simone de Beauvoir. And um, learning about the history of these things makes me understand how far, how embedded these attitudes are, yeah. how deeply, like thousands of years. And so it is uh, going to take, it is taking a long time to change, but it is changing. I, I mean, I, and I think, um, you know, the, the announcement that they're going to put more money into childcare is a good start, but it's such a small start. Uh, Fiona Martin, it's almost unbelievable that this story is actually true. Were you aware of this? Yes, in fact, I am aware of it. And one of the first letters I wrote to the Minister was about this very issue. So I agree with the lady that's asked the question and I think that it should be changed, that we should have an even um, playing field between um, parents. Wh which um, minister did you write to? At the time, it was Minister Rustin. OK, and what response did you get? Uh, I didn't get the response that I wanted, so I'm, I'm hoping to still change it and I'm confident that we should um, move in that direction because it should be a choice that parents make, which parent goes back to work. It shouldn't be um, just based on, on the uh, mother's um, financial circumstances. It should be a choice that their parents make. Something I just want to say here is that we can make all kinds of incremental steps towards improving the situation, as Alan just said. But fundamentally, we will not fix inequality in the workplace until an employer is as afraid and resentful of a man becoming a father as they currently are afraid and resentful of women becoming mothers. And so how do you, how do, you do that? It has to be use it or lose it. You have to give a certain amount, and it's for the parents, and it has to be just as appealing it has to be just as potentially lucrative for a man to step away as it is for a woman, um, to the point where an employer is across the board equally terrified of anyone becoming a parent. <laughs> <laughs> but part of the problem... Do, does, that make but, it, does that make economic sense, Alan? Well, part, part of the problem, Hamish, is I think the gender pay gap, so that when families make a decision to who's going to stay at home, it usually is the right decision financially for the family for the, for the man to go back to work. Right, for, that's well, I mean, so. That's, I'm not. I'm not saying yeah. that's that's great. I mean, that's the problem, in a way. I mean, and um, so families make rational decisions on those bases because women get paid less. But women get paid less because they're not promoted as much because they face discrimination in the workplace. Because, because they people... might get pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <It's... laughs> no, I, so that's but, right. That's... But with a pay parental leave, uh, it's not that scientific. I mean, there should be more of it and it should be more flexible. Uh, the position of the party that I represent uh, is that we, our, our goal is to have 26 full uh, paid, 26 weeks of paid parental leave that can be used equally between the mother and the father. It should not be uh, gendered in the way that it is at the moment. Your goal? Is that the same thing as a promise? Uh, goal. What, 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 does, what does that mean? Uh, it means that we haven't come to a final position on it. it is so part it's, a bit, of, it's a bit wobbly, it's, it's a, a bit, bit rubbery. No, it, that's not the case. It's part of the National Labor Party platform um, and it is absolutely the view of the Labor Party that paid parental leave should apply equally to men and women and there should be more so, of it. I'm going to push you on this. If it's not wobbly, why then isn't it a promise? Uh, well, it's it's you, you know, it's not up to me to sit here and say this is a promise tonight. Obviously, there'll be discussions and a statement about this very clearly prior to the election. But I can say with absolute certainty to you and to the audience tonight and to um, uh, the person who, who just asked the question is that, is that there needs to be more weeks and they should be able to be used more flexibly. They don't have to be used all in one block. It could be the way in which couples want to take the leave and there should be um, a greater flexibility in both access for men and women. My question is for Alan. Um, at the risk of being a privileged middle-aged white guy, asking <laughs> another privileged middle-aged white guy to pontificate on social equity, I wanted to ask you about supercharged housing prices. For decades, the politics of fear 
has stalled a meaningful tax reform. Legislative and regulatory responses to the problem have been simplistic and sometimes exacerbated the problem. Does the impact of COVID-19 provide an opportunity for our politicians to rewrite the playbook? And if so, what initiatives should be at the top of their list? Yeah, Alan, what? <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, yeah, my kids are in the same position, can't, uh, trying to get a house, uh, finding it's really difficult. Um, prices are so high. Um, but the thing is, the problem is that we call it an affordability crisis yes. or an unaffordability crisis. And part of the problem is that houses have never been more affordable because of interest rates where they are. You know, the oh. mortgage rates are 2%. So um, everyone can afford a house uh, now because that, of the repayments. That's a pretty generous are explanation <laughs> sure. for no, the situation. The I mean. reason prices are going up is because everyone's bidding them up because they can afford to pay the repayments. That doesn't help with the deposit. I but, if, but if you're a young person and you're bidding on a one or two bedroom flat, the reality is you're bidding against superannuants who are buying an investment yes. property. Mm. Well, um, uh, yeah, well, the, the, uh, the, the, <laughs> uh, the, the, the statistics have shown that first home buyers have been the big drivers of the latest boom in house prices over the past 12 months. First home buyers have really come into the market and they are bidding. It's just in the past month... Come on, you're not going to blame first home buyers for No, I'm not, blame, the, I'm not blaming them. I'm just, saying, I'm just saying that first home buyers have been a huge, a big entrance into the market in the last 12 months. Investors less so. Last time, in the boom of 2015-16, uh, it was all about investors. This time, it's been more about first home buyers and other you know, owner-occupiers upgrading. Less so investors, although that's now changing a bit. Um, the problem, fundamental problem, which is to do with COVID, is, is that the cash rate is 0.1%. That's the problem. Um, uh, you know, that, that, uh, the, the Reserve Bank manipulating interest rates in order to achieve a, um, an economic outcome uh, is distorting asset prices of all sorts, particularly property, but also shares. Um, so all asset prices are being distorted. Uh, house prices are being driven up. Um, uh, the affordability, if you measure it in terms of repayment, is quite low. I mean, in the sense that it, houses are affordable. The problem is getting a deposit together. And then you get down to questions of intergenerational equity and are the parents sitting on a whole lot of money in a house uh, that's too big for them and should they then start to share that money either through a reverse mortgage with the children uh, so that they can... Uh, I mean, that's OK if you've got parents who own their house, of course, if your parents don't own their house. But I think that there is an issue about uh, uh, helping kids get deposits. I mean, because parents are living too much too, too long now. Some would say... <laughs> no, but, uh, but by the time the parents die, yeah. the kids have retired. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some arguing, actually, you should give them their super to help them buy a house. Well, yeah, well, super won't do it, really. I mean, the, uh, the kids have got... Kids haven't got any money in super yet. I mean, it takes ages to build up enough in super to make a difference to get a sort of house deposit. So that's really not going to that's not going to cut it. I mean, uh, the, that, well, what about that... everyone that everyone has to rent though? They'll never ever be able to buy a home. Yeah. Well. <laughs> and the hex repayment threshold in the year 2017 to 18 used to be 55 grand, yeah. and now be, it's 45. I seem to be coming across as um, some kind of defender of this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, but the thing is, <laughs> uh, one of the problems with being a tenant is that the laws in Australia uh, favour landlords, and um, they're true. only just starting to change. In Europe, it's okay to be a tenant. People are tenants all their lives. It's fine because you get protected. In America, there's rent control. We have none of that in Australia. Tenants are really screwed here. And that's why everyone tries to buy a house. But if tenants were looked after better um, just... with the laws and if there was some sort of rent control, then it wouldn't be such a big Long deal. Long leases. I mean, it, it, look, it, it is terrible if you end up retiring... I'm going to give one very bright, brief final thought to Fiona Martin, who I can see is trying to get in on the conversation. If you could keep it brief, because we're out of time. 
Look, we definitely have the highest level of first home owners since um, 2009. So we, we, we are doing well with first home owners and that's because we've put in place some effective programs. Um, the first home owners deposit scheme, for example, we're doing incredibly well there. We had um, up to, I think, 26,000 recipients of that program that we implemented. And also we put in place um, Home Builder, which uh, we had 121,000 um, applications for. So these programs have proven effective and they're programs that we've implemented. Have they, Alan Cole? Have, they, have, have they proved the effective or is it just the interest rates? Of first home owner buyers. Well, those first home owner grants have just gone on the price. People, the first home buyers have just, um, well, you know. <laughs> Okay. They just use the money and bid the price up, and it's you know it's it, the problem. Problem is that everything that you do for it just drives prices up higher, including interest rates lower. Well, on, on that happy new, new, news, <laughs> that's almost all we have time for tonight. Some music for you in a moment, but first, would you please thank our wonderful panel? Thanks, everyone. Linda Burney, Bree Lee, Alan Kohler, Fiona Martin, and Jess Hill. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, and to those of you streaming us on iView. Next week, we'll be live at the Canberra Theatre answering your questions on this year's federal budget. I'll be joined by an all-politician panel, including Jane Hume, Jim Chalmers, Larissa Waters and Jackie Lambie. We're leaving you tonight with a performance from Julia Stone. It's a song from her new album. Ladies and gentlemen, Julia Stone with 60 Summers. <laughs> with lovers 60 summers